Do you know how many people like you and I get high on their own supply just because they won somewhere else? They become delusional that they think the next thing's gonna work? I think that as soon as you give the vibe out to the universe that you're smarter than, that you're better than, you've got it rigged. You're finished. The Gary V Audio Experience. All right, Podcast Nation, we are back. As I said uh, many times with the Be Friends NFT project exploding, I'll be doing less interviews in 2022, but more meaningful ones or people that I think can bring you uh, uh, a lot of value. And uh, our guest today is definitely someone who who share friends and I've heard really great things, but we've never really been able to chop up. As a matter of fact, it's the first time we're really even jamming together. But um, Thomas Toll is with us. I'm going to let him uh, kind of give us a three minute, five minute, two minute kind of comic book number one little bio and how he sees himself or things he's done. And then we'll kind of uh, shoot the shit about um, some of those themes and, and kind of where the world is. My friend, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me on. I'm happy to do it. So for everybody on here that, you know, when they Google you, it says American businessman. How do you speak about yourself? Hopefully very little. <laughs> Is that's that's always uh, feels awkward, strange, and you know. So uh, look, I've I've been very fortunate in my life. There's no no question about it. And uh, what I enjoy doing is looking at opportunities, markets, companies, uh, and then applying innovation, technology, and so forth to hopefully give that company a uh, a, a chance. To, to do something both different and, and profitable. Um, and I've gone through, you know, a number of iterations in my career from uh, being in tech venture capital. Uh, my background is in tech and finance. Took a big left-hand turn in, in my life. I had no media experience, uh, but I was fascinated by the way movies and television was financed and their revenue streams. This was back in 2004. Uh, and thought I could bring institutional capital to that ecosystem, uh, built legendary into a, a, a pretty sizable company. Um, along the way, introduced- Everybody who's listening, what, what is legendary, a production company? Yeah, so legendary uh, was is a production company that does movies, television, there was a comic book division, there was a digital division, um, you know, et cetera. I sold the company back in 2016 uh, and one of the things that happened along the way is using data science to do, we felt like a much better job of deploying capital, not to make film and television or to predict how audiences would feel and all that stuff. I, you know, I had the chance to partner with Chris Nolan and folks like that. So that on the creative side, that, that worked well. Uh, but we were really the first company to use data science to find people who are persuadable, to find audiences and talk to them in a very uh, sort of bespoke way in, in order to cause an outcome. And that, that made a big difference for the company. That led me, uh, after selling it, uh, to form Tulco, which I know is not very imaginative in terms of the <laughs> name, but it's a holding company. Listen, you're talking to somebody who's got Vayner, Vayner land. I mean, I'm, I like the last, I, it just makes it easy. Well, in our case, uh, the joke of it was they kept asking me to come up with a name and it's a holding company, right? So it's yeah. not a brand. Right. And they kept jokingly, instead of calling it Nuco, they'd call it Tulco. And one day they're like, look, man, we need to wire money. So what's the name of the company? And that I'd love to tell you a better story, but that's that's how that happened. And the idea behind Tulco was we go and buy either whole companies or usually controlling stakes in them. And besides providing uh, the capital and, and hopefully some business acumen, uh, we also had Tulco Labs, which was sort of a, you know, I was always uh, enamored with Bell Labs and what Bell Labs meant in terms of innovation. So we had practitioners of artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, so we would bring those resources to bear in companies that didn't traditionally have a lot of innovation and would not have access to folks like that. And, it, and it's worked well. You know, do you, do you think of yourself as an operator? 
Well, I certainly, you know, was I ran legendary and so forth, but it's not my it's not my favorite thing to do. My favorite thing you, to do is go ahead. I'm sorry, finish your thought. Well, no, I'm just gonna say my favorite thing to do is to partner with great operators uh, and provide capital input, you know, access to strategic capital. financial strategic financial arbitrage. Yes, but I think also if I have uh, any skill sets, which is certainly up for debate, it's looking at a business or looking at a sector and thinking about it differently, right? And saying- Seeing white, seeing yeah. white space, seeing yeah. white space that, but you know, it's funny. I mean, like, let's actually break this down because even just listening to the way you're deploying humility and a little self-deprecation, because I understand it, and I do it at times, though I'm a little bit more comfortable being like, look, I'm really good at this one thing and I suck shit. My, I usually go with, I suck shit at these 99 things, but I'm fucking really good at this one thing. Let's break this down because I now I'm starting to see where I may want to take this. We have a lot of people listening. I'm, in 40, I mean, what is it really actually? In eight minutes, what's very clear to me, I'm like, oh, here's my connection point with this other winning player. There's a level of self-awareness that I am hypothesizing that we share that allows us to squeeze the shit out of the things we like and are good at versus over obsessing at maybe some of the things we're not as good at. And in that there's a real level of like happiness and success. When I say that, does that connect? And then more importantly, for everyone who's listening, what's the learning in that in their world of what they may be good or not good at thoughts? Well, I, I think there's a blend of extreme intellectual honesty, right? Being able to look at yourself, and if you can, and it's a hard thing, is to put ego aside and say, what am I good at? What am I not good at? What makes me happy and fulfilled? And what are the things that even I, even though I know I wish I were better at it, is it worth spending the cycles, those 10,000 hours to get good at something versus using my time elsewhere? And, you know, the other thing that I think in this day and age, I'm not on any social media and I'm not here to bash or whatever else. It's just not interesting for me. Yep. And, you know, so because you have to spend so much time curating and so forth. Uh, and I also know I'm bound to say something stupid, which then gets mm -hmm. amplified and so forth. So I try to be very comfortable with, look, this is what I like. This is what I think I'm pretty good at. And I'm going to stay on, you know, on that highway. Um, and at the same time, I think you also have to have the conviction that, look, if you've, you know, if, if you've done the homework and you've convinced yourself that something is real important, it's an opportunity, then even if there are a chorus of well-meaning people telling you you're, you're stupid, or you're wrong, or you shouldn't do this, even if they're well-intentioned, you have to have a conviction, conviction to say, no, no, I, I've measured twice, I'm gonna cut once. And, and, and on that note, do you factor in regret as a variable to why you're willing to make that cut? So when I hear you say that, that's been the story of my life as well. I also am a little bit more like white space, new stuff, right? One of the big factors in my world and that is, I just know that when I'm 87, whether I was right or wrong, I'll always regret not cutting that one time because I've already gotten to that convinced place. And if God forbid I let my dad or you, if we became best friends for 20 years and I respected you, anybody, if I let them convince me otherwise that I would be too accountable to knowing at the end of the day it was my call and I would not be willing to point fingers, and then I would be disappointed in the regret of not tasting the experience, and that actually drives me almost more than any, even more than thinking I'm gonna win and make money and all that. Like, it's just like the fear of regretting it being like, fuck, because I'd rather die on my sword than someone else's. I, I think that's well said. And, and frankly, I think if that is partnered, if you will, with again, that awareness to say, have I really thought about this? Mm -hmm. Do I have any expertise? Have I consulted with people? And have I convinced myself in a rational fashion and now I am willing to take yeah. that mountain? Yeah. If you haven't done that work, 
because there's plenty of times. Oh, you know how many people like you and I get high on their own supply just because they won somewhere else? They become delusional that they think the next thing's going to work? I, I have to tell you, that is, you know, I, uh, I think that as soon as you give the vibe out to the universe that you're smarter than, that you're better than, you've got it rigged. You're finished. I, I think the universe will come back and teach. Are you, a, are you a are you a box? I know you love football like me, and you've accomplished a lot of things. I want to buy the New York Jets. Do you have a sense of? Do you like boxing or MMA? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm there's... completely convinced yeah. that that's what happens to great fighters. Completely. Well, look. It, at the end of the day, you know, there's something uh, certainly very primal about two people go into a ring and it's pretty clear yeah. most of the time at yeah. the end of it. And I think that, um, again, you think about what it takes to be a great fighter. It has to be, you have to be crazy enough and have enough resiliency and hubris to yes. enter that ring. But at the same time, you have to have enough of check yourself to say, Hey, is it time to stop? Is it? So I think that's a really, I'm going to show you thing. something. Keep talking. I'm going to show you something. Oh, my goodness. I, I mean, I, you're going to lose viewers by the minute if I just no sit way. here and narrate. You're looking good. All right. So I just wrote this book, right? This is where we're going the whole way. And it talks about in, it, emotional ingredients. And I'm listening to you. And obviously, I've known about your success from afar. And I'm getting excited because I'm like, man, I think I really landed on something with this concept of ingredients. So here are the ones that I value. The fact that you're talking right now for the last seven minutes about number 10 and 11 in combination and so few people understand that 10 and 11 feel like they're opposites, but when mixed together, like making a meal, that's what you're describing to me right now. I'm, I'm literally, I don't know if you see it, I have goosebumps because you have been talking for seven minutes about conviction mixed equally with humility and that. And you know this, a lot of people struggle when you carry, it's kind of how I think about the world right now. We're living in a very, you know this, a very red and blue world. And I'm like, it's fucking purple. It's, if you can't, if you don't go to purple, you're fucked. It's not, how, how are people walking? I mean, no matter how conservative or liberal you are, no matter what, if you do not have the intellect to, or the humility or the curiosity to understand that it's fucking purple, and that's what you're saying right now, you are, you went right down a path right away, which I'm a huge fan of 10 and 11. Humility mixed with conviction because your humility will protect you because that's what you were talking about. Doing the home, that humility allows you to stay curious and open to somebody talking you out of it along the way or making a point or a data set that may make you look at it slightly different, no? Uh, I think that's exactly right. And you have hopefully some internal compass that says, has I have I earned this, right? Have I put the work in? And the reason I have conviction isn't because I read something on the internet or the last <laughs> person I talked to said, no, it's I did the work and therefore I've earned the right to, to dig in on this position. Look, and in terms of purple, the thing that I am hopeful of, I love this country. Uh, you know, I came from very, you know, single mom, poor background. This country afforded me the opportunity uh, to to you know mm -hmm. do what I've what I've been fortunate enough to do, and at the same time, I always think about the whole point of this being the United States is that it's a whole big country of different cultures Perfect. and different things. But at the end of the day, what's made this country great is a, is a belief in certain things, and as soon as you villainize the other side, that it's not just that we don't see it the same way because I've had different life experiences than you have, but you're a villain and now you're a bad person or you're a dummy. I, I just, I think that that's- We've lost civility and yes. on both sides and we are going to need to lean into civility and purple or we're in deep trouble. Let's go to that childhood real quick. Were, you know, I, I was born in the Soviet Union. So talk about somebody who really values Man. this. Yeah. Yeah. I came here when I was three, so I don't remember it. Obviously, my parents lived until they were 22 there, so I have a lot of feelings towards it. But we grew up very, like, immigrant, eight family members in a studio apartment. So I, I associate to humble beginnings. What, what? I guess here's the first question. Were you an entrepreneurial kid? Yeah, by necessity. You know, it's one of these things that, um, you, you know, 
everybody that has had some challenge as a kid or in life, I'm not going to sit here and say when I was eight years old that I thought to myself, wow, you know what? This sucks, but I'm building resiliency. I'll bet this will affect me. No, you didn't, you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't say a 10, my favorite sentence of, you know, adversity is the foundation of success. Yeah, no, I just said this. Neither sucks. did I. But, you know, look, there is the things that I do think happened is um, where I was in life made me comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then the second thing, you know, my mom. Is that, is that why you're petrified of eighth place trophies? Because that's why I'm petrified of them. Like, <laughs> well, I'm me, not I'm me, not a big look. I'm not a big particip participation trophy person. I think life, whether you like it or not, keeps score. Um, and I think that even with our foreign adversaries at this point, we're, we're sort of wishing and hoping that we lived in a different world than we do, right? And I, I wonder sometimes when I watch Americans screaming at each other, if, if, uh, if they don't understand that we have foreign adversaries that are a true challenge and, and that we keep taking our eye off the ball. Yeah, and I think if you deploy any level of common sense and understand scale and influence, like, I would argue that it's already a foregone conclusion. Like, like there is no scenario of our great, great grandkids not in a world where, chi you know, China's only vulnerability is people forget they're actually communists. And thus that's against the human spirit and they'll have to figure that out. But China runs its con country the way we run businesses. It's communism with capitalism, right? Like every good company, your legendary Vayner, I promise you, here's what it looks like. You empower people to do a ton of shit, but you at the tippy top, you're gonna make three to six decisions that are not debatable. They're right. just, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, but I think more taking it out of the macro and the geopolitical, because I wanna get this out of you, because now I've got a sense of your philosophical framework, which I think we can extract some really cool insights for some of the entrepreneurs and executives that are listening. Tell, actually, before I make this assumption, would you argue, and I based on that hard pivot you made, I think we share another thing I'm starting to sense, do you find yourself curious? Do you think curiosity has helped you go down some of these paths? And because of that curiosity, you're coming in with fresh eyes. And when you come in with fresh eyes, sometimes you can see things that the people that have been living in it forever can't see anymore. Well, look, I could tell you uh, intellectual curiosity has been a staple of my life since I was a little kid. I, I read voraciously, eclectically, um, and, I, and I think that that's extraordinarily important. And once you latch on to something, going down that rabbit hole and saying, I want to know everything there is to know about this. Like, this and you said something important eclectically, right? Like you're saying things, I want to make sure everybody caught that because that was, I thought that was a very important word. You're saying like, you may randomly find coin collecting interesting out of left field because you heard somebody say one thing and then actually start reading and then actually may go even deep. And then you decide, actually, after this first book, I'm going to go deep. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I think. And, and whether that comes in a business opportunity, personal satisfaction. And, and I, I think also that context with, with learning and knowledge is everything, right? If you can, whether it's history whether it's science, I'm, I'm a huge believer in math and science. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm on the board at Carnegie Mellon and I'm on the uh, engineering school advisory board at MIT. So I'm proximate to some pretty amazing things. That's some fancy bougie shit there, my friend. Uh, yeah, just I'm just standing next to them and hoping osmosis <laughs> happens. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, that curiosity and being not only curious, but hope, but, but trying to get context around that. So it's either applicable or you've built mental models and things that allow pattern recognition to happen. I think all those things are extremely important. Let me ask you a question that really just popped up after this enjoyable 20 minutes. Do you believe that being underestimated is a tremendous advantage and gift? That's an interesting question because I think sometimes, yes, being underregarded allows you the opportunity to grow without people trying to stop that growth. There are other times when you want to cut through all the crap and just say, look, let, let's let's try to fast forward to the real thing because there's so enough. You're, 
So what you're saying there is because you value actual execution and practicality that after putting some wins on the board in your life, that that reputation allows you in that meeting setting or boardroom or whatever environment is to maybe speed up the waste. No question about it, because look, there is a certain point where you've done enough in your career to not have to explain either who you are or what, hey, about, what about when you're innovating at scale? So, for example, one thing that I find interesting about my career is I pivot so much. And even though I continuously put wins on the board, when you're going to something so new, it's almost like you're doing the same thing all over again. And I also think and I've come to realize this in my mid 40 now that, oh, I actually enjoy being underestimated. I like being an underdog. This is probably why I'm a Jets fan, by the way. Uh, you know, um, but because I do that to myself, there is a level of like having to repeat certain things. Um, and I'm, I'm, but at the same token, to your point, which is why I use that analogy, I do enjoy this point of my career where I could be like, hey, can we just get to this point? Because talk about somebody who's obsessed with seven minute meetings. I don't want to waste one minute because it's the only resource besides okay. health that I care about. And I don't want to have a 45 minute meeting pandering to people's insecurities and lack of knowledge of the subject matter. Let's just get to the punchline and collectively do something here. Look, I think that's absolutely right. And I, I it's always interesting to me that people are willing to waste money, um, or, or I'm sorry, misspeaking, the exact opposite, that they obsess over saving money but and, fuck up time. But got time you. is like, oh, you know, I can, because I, I I doubt that anybody on their deathbed says, bring me my financial statements. Not one person. Right? So that's a regret, by the way. Well, it, one of the things that speaks to me just in terms of reading and so forth is stoicism, right? It's hard to apply every day, but I I, I find if, if you haven't read Marcus Aurelius or, or you know, any of the stoics, it's worth visiting. And one of the things that they talk I heard, about. I heard Ryan Holiday. Oh, Ryan's a good friend. So Ryan has been enjoying the last five years just whispering to me, t like taking clips of me and being like, do you know how much of a stoic you are? And I'm actually very interesting. I love information, but I've come to learn. I haven't really gotten classified, though I may. It just takes time back to what we're talking about. I clearly have a massive reading comprehension issue. So I... I don't read books. Obviously I read a lot of micro and I listen and watch a lot, um, but he just gets a kick out of it. And it's interesting you're bringing it up because he's really pounding up me on like how much I am it. Well, look, I, I Ryan's a great guy, great author, um, big thinker. And I, a lot of their philosophy speaks to me just because you worry about what you control and, you know, their whole thing is you, you should contemplate death every day, not in a morbid way, but just to say, look, we all have an expiration date, right? And if COVID hasn't shoved that like right up in your face, that, you know, you need to really focus on not only what's important, but even relationships, people you care about, you know, making sure that you continue to cultivate that. Um, so it's something I at least try to say to myself, did I do a good job today? of spending time on things that matter and that there's real yield. Before we get you out of here, since we're running out of time, <clears throat> I want to go current events in business um, because I'm going to take advantage now that I understand how much I enjoy your macro. Let's go a little micro. Where, if anywhere, are you with your curiosity or digging into of NFTs? Well, I have a number of investments in that world. And obviously we're hearing all kinds of monikers now, right? There's, there's NFT, uh, there, there's, there's tokens, there's crypto, there's web 3.0, all, all these different things. And I, I do have a number of, uh, of investments uh, in that world. The thing that's interesting to me that I'm trying to watch is what is the intrinsic value going to be and how will it stand the test of time and sort itself out there's no question in my mind that digital goods, right? If we assign value to them, that is no different than, hey, I have a baseball card and it has a value because 
Other people okay. say it, them, right? It's, it's a shared myth sort of thing. Um, the thing that's interesting to me uh, about crypto is what happens when governments writ large sort of say, okay, now this currency has the full faith and credit of the US, of whatever it is. It's going to be really interesting to watch what that policy looks, looks like, uh, the tax situation, how all of that is going to unfold. I have some very, very smart friends in, in deep finance that tell me that they think this will be one of the biggest sort of opportunities and transfer of wealth in human history as this thing unfolds. Yeah. So I'm trying to participate, but also be thoughtful. Yeah. yeah. And just because I don't, I don't Talk quite know where it's let going. Me, let me do a little more rapid round. I apologize. I, I love the in-depth questions. Movie theaters, given your background, state of the union of the movie theater business, hot takes, two, three sentences. What are you thinking? Tough business going forward. I don't think movies are going you anywhere. Can, you think they can innovate to go super, like I keep wondering, would I pay, why am I willing to pay $400 for a sushi night? Like there's gotta be a way to get me to pay 300 bucks for the new Batman. There's gotta be, no? Well, but the question is, do you need that large box piece of real estate, which yeah. you're talking to someone who loves going to the movies, yeah, that communal too. experience? Yeah, the, that's my point, right? The community, like, like the answer is no, but the but the world is and now instead of or, right? And, like, right? like sometimes I want to sit and like I watch the Lucille Ball thing on Amazon Prime. I didn't need to go to the theater for that, you know. Uh, a Marvel versus DC crossover super film of Justice League versus, you know, like Avengers with, you know, I don't know, I could see myself wanting to, especially, you know, I like the head to head shit. That could be really fun in the theater to see who likes the one side or the other. Yeah, I think the other challenge is just the appointment nature of it. So if I need to go out at 740, park a car, go inside, but you're so willing to do that for dinner so many times a month. Look, the, the question is though, if you have a 60 inch flat screen at home in high def or 4K. Your point, this is a combo of and, right? It, to your point, the yeah. experience so, now is so, I mean, look, you and I, how old are you, my friend? I am 51. You look great, so I'm 46. We've had the same basic thing, right? Ghostbusters comes out. You know that if you don't go see it there, that you're not going to see it for 18 months on VHS and you're going to be on your shitty team. Like it's like, right. They're so to your point, but I still think the communal and then I still think food and beverage, you know, I know these, some of these things have popped up, right? I went to one in Naples. You can get a nice little glass of wine, but I still don't think they broke the format. Listen, we've, we've run out of time. I, I would love to do this again in the future. I loved, I really enjoyed this. Me too. Thank you very much for having me on. Thanks for being on.